Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to Live at 555 this morning on this Friday morning. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, we are continuing our study uh, through the book of James and James chapter uh, 2, verses 14 through 17. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Um, as we continue on in James chapter 2, yesterday we kind of wrapped up the first section. And the first section that John was, or that James, let me think about who we're talking about here. The first section that James was dealing with was uh, this idea of showing partiality and that we, uh, that we shouldn't be doing that. We as Christians should not be showing partiality. Uh, we need to not be a, a respecter of persons. We shouldn't treat people different because of what they have or don't have or what they look like or don't look like or whatever. And he makes this point there in the first 13 verses. Now starting here in James chapter 2 verse 14, we get to a very uh, misunderstood passage. We're going to look at verses 14 through 17 this morning. So James chapter 2 verse 14, James says this, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Hmm. If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Ah, okay. This is a very, very fascinating section of scripture that uh, James gets into, and he's going to continue on in this section. We'll be here for a few days. Uh, Martin Luther, you guys are familiar with the early reformer. Uh, he hated this passage. He hated it so much that he said it wasn't scripture and he wanted it thrown into the river. Why? Because it appears at reading that James is contradicting Paul. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 that you're saved by grace through faith, that it's not of works, in spite of works. It, 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 it's a gift of God, not of man, not of yourself, lest anyone should boast. So you have Paul who lays out for us in the book of Romans, and honestly in pretty much all of his epistles, that salvation is a, a um, that salvation is received on our end by our faith. And then you get over here to James, and James is trying to tell you, people say, that your faith actually isn't enough, that you have to have faith plus works. Yet Paul makes it very clear it's not faith and works. He actually says if that's the case, you have a different gospel. You have the wrong gospel. So what is James talking about here when he says in verse number 14, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? A few things we need to um, challenge ourselves on as we look at James chapter 2, verse 14. One of the problems that we face in our uh, minds is that what some of these words mean to us. Because when we read a word, we think that it uh, automatically applies to what we want it to mean. But sometimes words have more than one meaning. And I want to point this out. The key to understanding what James is telling us here today, because James is telling us that faith without works is dead. He's going to make this point clear. He's saying, get this. James is saying, and you got to stick with me through this whole study or else you're going to be confused uh, throughout the next couple of, James, of days. But James is saying to his readers, faith without works cannot save you. Now, here's the question we have to ask ourselves. What does he mean when he talks about saving? James says in verse 14, what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him. When James uses the term save, what does he mean? Because I know what you think it means 
When you read that word saved, you think of saved. You think of eternal life. You think of being born again. Why do you think that way? Because that word is used many times in that context, but that word is not always used in that context. Hagen, are you sure? What are you getting at? Can you prove that to me from the word? Yes, I can. In Matthew chapter 14, verse number 30, here's a great example of the word saved being used, not talking about uh, eternal salvation, but talking about a temporal state. James or uh, Matthew chapter 14 verse 30. This is when Jesus is walking on the water and he calls Peter out to follow him. And Peter starts to walk on the waves and Peter starts to sink. So what does Peter say? Peter cries out, Matthew chapter 14 verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and he, Peter, began to sink and he cried out and he said, Lord, save me. Is Peter, in this moment of him sinking in the Sea of Galilee, praying for Jesus to save his soul from hell? No. What is he praying? Lord, save me. Same Greek word. Same Greek word Paul uses when he's talking about our eternal salvation. Peter uses when he cries out to the Lord to save him from drowning in the waves. So what's the point you're making, Hagen? My point is that every time you see the English word saved in the Bible, you automatically think that it means it's talking about eternal salvation, but that's not the case. So how can we tell the difference when we're reading the Bible when the word saved is talking about going to heaven, eternity, and the word saved is talking about rescuing us from our present circumstances? Context. You see, you have to read the context to determine that. When you read Matthew chapter 14, the context, the context tells you that, 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 that Peter is not crying out for eternal salvation there. He's crying out to be saved from his present circumstances, his current situation. When you read uh, Paul's epistles, he makes it very clear uh, what he's talking about there. Now, a key to understanding James 2.14 is what James has already told us back in James chapter 1, verse 21. He says, therefore, remember he said this, lay aside all filthiness that overflows in the overflow of wickedness and receive with weakness, meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. We need to set aside all filthiness. Does setting aside all filthiness save us? No. But he tells us we need to set aside all filthiness, all wickedness, and receive with weakness the implanted word that we may be saved. Saved from what? That we may be saved from this world. Okay? James here is saying that um, your faith without works is dead and your dead faith cannot save you from this corrupt world can it can can your faith alone save you to eternity yeah that's the point of paul's epistle the point of james's epistle is that your faith cannot save you from this um messed up world if you do not have works and here I, just continue to track with me here okay because this is the only way that it makes sense. If you think that James is talking about eternal salvation, you have a problem. Because you're going to fall into a messy trap. And the messy trap that you're going to fall into is an illogical one. An inconsistent one. And I, I, I'm watching the time here because I can talk for hours about this. And we're going to go through the next couple of days uh, really taking this apart. But here's the thing that many people say. Christians, pastors will say this. I know pastors... I know Calvary Chapel pastors that fall into this trap. They say silly things like this. Salvation is free, but it'll cost you everything. That doesn't make any sense at all. Either you are saved simply by the grace of Jesus Christ, or you're not. Either your works do not merit salvation at all, or they do. 
and from Isaiah all the way out back in Genesis, we'll get to this Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him to righteousness. From the beginning to the end, justification in the sight of God is by faith and faith alone. But then people get to James and they don't know what to do. So they make up these clever sayings like, well, salvation is free. All you have to do is receive Jesus, the finished work of Jesus. But if you're not doing good stuff, then you're not actually saved. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought my salvation isn't about me, it's about Jesus. It is. But you're telling me if I don't do good things, I'm not saved? Yeah, we have a problem, okay? It's either Jesus alone or it's not. The Bible makes it very clear. Read the Gospel of John. Read Paul's epistles. You are saved by grace through faith. It is not of yourself. So when we get to passages like James that's talking about our faith that should be working, he's not talking about saving our soul from an eternity in hell. He's talking about saving our life from the messiness of this world. The word that we would use for that is called sanctification. You see, our good works, the working out of the ministry of the Holy Spirit through our lives sanctifies us through this life. It's um, We are positionally made holy in the sight of God because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But practically right now on this earth, this is a little secret between you and me, you're still kind of really messed up. <laughs> Did you know that? Positionally before the throne of God because the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed you, you are perfect. You are clothed in Jesus' righteousness. But practically right now, you're kind of a screwball. You know that, right? I, I hope I'm not ruining your morning by telling you that. So we are in this sanctification process on this earth. We are being conformed, Paul would say, uh, Romans chapter 12, molded into, conformed into the image of Christ. James is talking about that sanctification, being saved from this world not being saved from an eternity separated from God. And if you don't understand this point, you're going to be very confused when you try to share the gospel with someone because you can fall into the same trap of saying, salvation is free, but it will cost you everything. Not true. Salvation is free because it cost Jesus everything. And by simply putting your faith and trust in Jesus, you are born again. How do you know you're born again? Because you did what the Bible says. What does the Bible say you need to do to be born again? To confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. To believe in your heart that, that God raised him from the dead. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, and you will be saved. That's all it takes. Believing in Jesus is what gets you adopted into his family. Now, now is where James kicks in. Now that you're saved by grace from the, um, now that you're saved from the punishment of hell by grace, now to be saved from this world, from the messiness of this world, it's going to take not just now that faith that saved you, it's going, that saved you from hell, it's going to take some work, it's going to take the working out of that faith in your life. You know, that uh, there's just a lot of different things and I, I don't want to go on all morning with this and again tomorrow we're going to get into more of this but but there's a few things that you just have to realize as a Christian and that is that you are saved because of Jesus okay James when he uses that word saved there is what it is all about you have to realize the context of the word saved in James chapter 2 because if you think that it's talking about eternal salvation, you are going to have inconsistencies. The gospel cannot make sense if James is talking about your works justifying you before God. Because, J because Paul harps it over and over and over again. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. Our works don't justify us before God. But our works, our good works, now that we are saved from eternity in hell, save us from the messiness of this world. Just like Peter sinking in the Sea of Galilee, Lord, save me. 
our works, our faithfulness, our obedience to the Lord saves us from being sunk, from being drowned in this world around us. If Peter would have drowned in the Sea of Galilee, he would have still been saved eternally, but he wouldn't have been saved from his present circumstance. Do you understand what I'm saying? So too for you and me. We can be saved eternally, yet be drowned out by the circumstances and the messiness of this world, and our faith becomes dead, James will say. But you have the faith. The faith is dead, though. The faith is still present. The faith is just not valuable. It's not working. It's not doing what it's supposed to do, but it's still there. We'll get into that later on. There's so many different things we can talk about here. And, and honestly, the majority of people out there are going to disagree with me on this, just so you know. This is kind of an abstract interpretation of this passage, but I'm telling you, if I could sit down with anyone and talk them through it, they have to come to the same conclusion because it's the only one that makes sense consistently. God is a God of a logic and order, and he cannot say you're saved by grace alone, not of works, and then say you're saved by grace and works and be talking about the same type of saving. It just cannot make sense. So the only way to, the only logical way and the only honest way when it comes to interpreting the Bible is to step back and say, is it possible when I read these passages, I'm approaching them with some preconceived notions, and it might be that, that, that there's, they're talking about separate salvations, that Paul is talking about the eternal salvation that leads us to heaven, and James is talking to us about being saved from this world, just like Peter cried out to Jesus there on the Sea of Galilee. Again, we'll be on this topic for a few days. We'll dive into it. I know this might get some of you guys riled up a little bit and interested in uh, some different things that I'm going to say uh, later on this week. But I'm telling you, um, it's the only way to read it. It really is. Uh, you can get in, and we'll get into more of this, but I've rambled enough. The good news this morning is that your faith alone saves you from the penalty of of hell. It's the grace of Jesus Christ that gets you into heaven. Now, what we learned from James, it's your faith now and your works that save you from drowning in this world of chaos. Your faith that works is saving you from the messiness of this world. And some Christians, some Christians are fatalities of the world, yet they're still saved eternally. We'll get into that more later on. Let's pray. Hopefully I've confused you enough this morning, but I think it's pretty simple if you can just hear my point. Two different salvations. Salvation from hell, salvation from this world, from this, from the repercussions, from the messiness, from the fallenness of just the place that we live in. And uh, he'll continue on to talk about this here in a little bit. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for this morning, God. We thank you for your love and for your grace, Jesus. And thank you that we are saved by grace through faith. And that it's not of works, it's a gift of God, not of man, lest anyone should boast. But Lord, also thank you, Lord, that we are saved from this messiness of this world, Lord, by our faith and by our works. Lord, you... Um, you working through us is what saves us from drowning in the society and the messiness and the corruption of the world that we find ourselves living in today. So God, I pray that as we continue on through this section of James chapter 2 throughout the next couple of mornings, um, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and heart to understand your word and its context and its consistency, Lord, so that we do not walk away uh, confused about this stuff, but Lord, we would have some new light shined on it, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. So God, just go before us today. Um, Lord, help us just stay close to you, and Lord, help us glory in the fact that our salvation uh, from hell, our salvation into heaven 
is based upon your grace, Lord, and our faith in response to that grace. But Lord, realizing that our um, deliverance, our salvation, our rescuing from some of the circumstances of this life are a result of our faith and our works, Lord, being worked out in our lives. So God, help us uh, realize that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hope you guys have a great um, Friday, I guess is what it is. It's a Friday morning. We'll see you tomorrow morning live at 555 as we continue on uh, with some of this stuff. Again, I, and it, this is foreign to a lot of people. So many people do not know what to do with this passage. And uh, they, they'll dance around it. Uh, but we're going to deal with it. And we're going to deal with it in what I believe is the most honest way. Even though, and again, I'm fully aware, this is not the most popular way. You can go to many pastors in this community. You can go to many pastors, even in the camp that I belong to of Calvary Chapel. And they're not going to give you the same interpretation of the one that I'm giving you today. Um, but I am telling you. It's the only way. If you want a different interpretation, you can read John MacArthur's and he'll tell you what he thinks about it. But uh, I, I, it's just inconsistent. It doesn't make any sense unless you obviously uh, go about in the way that, that, that I'm going to try to do it for you throughout the next couple of mornings. But anyway, we'll see you tomorrow morning. It's interesting stuff. Uh, exercise your mind a little bit. Uh, leave behind some preconceived notions and let's see if we can make sense of some of this stuff. But have a good morning. We'll see you tomorrow.